Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Good afternoon from Cambridge. Thank you for joining today's Career Lunch and Learn program, Influencing Others When No One Seems to Be Listening. My name is Erin Hollis, and I'm an Associate Director here at the MIT Alumni Association, and I'll be serving as your moderator for today. As a reminder, our webinar is being broadcast live. Throughout the program, you may submit your questions using the Q&A feature in your Zoom toolbar. If you don't automatically see your toolbar, simply drag your mouse across the edges of your screen until it reappears. We'll be using the polling feature today. When you see the poll pop up on your screen, simply select your answer and hit submit. For all our listeners joining via YouTube, you may add your questions to the comments fields. You will notice um, a question, uh, an example on the slide that's currently being displayed on your screen. Um, in preparation for today's presentation, it would be helpful to be thinking of a recent influence conversation that did not go well for you. Um, perhaps a time where you walked away uh, from a conversation feeling dissatisfied or upset with the outcome. Um, not to worry though, if you haven't had time to do this, um, the presentation will still be helpful to you um, and the presentation will be available on YouTube uh, after, uh, after the broadcast today. And we'll share more uh, information on how to access that uh, later in the presentation. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, Stacy Lennon. Stacy, welcome. Hi, thank you. Great to be here. I'm going to provide a brief introduction for Stacy. Um, Stacy has over 20 years of experience as a negotiation advisor, a coach, a trainer for clients in North America, Europe, Asia, the Middle East, and the Sub-Sahara Africa. Stacy's consulting work focuses on helping her clients more clearly and explicitly link thought, action, and results, whether the client's goal is to manage a multilateral negotiation, align internal stakeholders, create a successful joint venture, increase sales, or improve a relationship with a crucial supplier, customer, partner, or stakeholder. Stacy has worked with thousands of people in industries ranging from technology to manufacturing, from humanitarian aid to investment banking. Clients have included BAE, Microsoft, Pixar, Intel, Merck, Chevron, and the World Health Organization, among many others. Currently, Stacy teaches leadership and negotiation at Tufts Gordon Institute. In 2016, she founded X Squared Consulting, focusing on gender-related dimensions of negotiation. Um, with that, Stacey, I'm gonna turn things over to you. Great, thank you, Erin. Um, I am really excited um, to be here with all of you um, virtually. I run into MIT alums periodically in my work with clients, but I've never gotten to talk to such a huge group of them at once, so I'm excited for that opportunity. Um, so, let me, um, let me set the stage a little bit um, for what we're gonna do together um, over this hour. Um, uh, for those of you wondering, I, it's, it's not sort of a natural progression to go from MIT into the world of negotiation consulting. Um, so just a brief explanation there. I was a, a course four and 11 um, at MIT. I did a joint degree and in my last semester of, of, not my last semester, my last IAP, I took a negotiation class and it sparked this interest that actually um, inspired me to make a big career shift. So I worked as a planner for a couple of years, but then got into this line of work. Um, and so I look forward to sharing with you things that um, I've learned both in just my years of working with clients, but also drawing on um, you know, recent research in, in social science, behavioral economics, um, neurobiology, sociology, psychology. That's what I love about my work. It's so interdisciplinary and there's so much to learn um, about um, us quirky human beings. Um, so let me just set the stage, um, uh, and I should say a big thank you um, to Aaron and Ellen um, and Kate who wrote the blog piece. Um, you guys are extremely good at your jobs. You made it very fun and easy for me to get ready for this. So thank you for that. Um, so let me set the stage here for what we're gonna talk about together. 
Um, first question, you know, on perhaps on your mind is, well, what do we even mean by influence? So here's what I mean by influence as, as we talk together this hour. Um, it's really uh, your ability to affect the thoughts, beliefs, behaviors, or decisions of another person. So let me say a few things about that definition. First, notice that the word control appears nowhere in that definition, and influence really is not the same thing as controlling somebody else or compelling anybody to make the decisions that you want them to make. Um, in my line of work, and I think in life generally, control is a bit of an illusion. Um, influencing people is not about, um, I, I don't have the Jedi mind tricks to magically guarantee results every time. What I do have is a lot of um, practical experience and um, just the wisdom of, of research that helps us understand what are the most likely <laughs> approaches you can take to, to, um, to enhance the, the probability that you will be able to affect the thoughts, beliefs, decisions, or actions of another person. Um, if any of you have children, you really understand the, the limits of control, right? I, I have every advantage you can think, power advantage you can think of over my kids, but I still can't make them do stuff as simple as like, don't use mommy's stapler, <laughs> right? As soon as I'm out of sight, there they are, um, breaking my stapler again and again. All right, so today isn't about giving you um, Jedi mind tricks or an ability to control other people. It is about giving you techniques um, to enhance your effectiveness. Secondly, we are influencing all the time. You know, the vast majority of your interactions with other human beings in this world are really about trying to influence them in one way or another. And frankly, we are naturals at it in the following sense. We came into this world and as infants, we did not have an ability to get all of our needs met on our own. So we had instinctive, automatic methods of influencing the bigger human beings around us to do things like feed us and clothe us and keep us safe and warm, right? We learned how to cry and scream um, you know, out of the gate. Now, hopefully you have all expanded your repertoire of influence techniques um, in the years since. Um, I, I trust that that is the case. Um, maybe you know people that really did not ever expand their repertoire, <laughs> but I'm assuming I'm operating with people who you know, frankly, you probably have approaches to your influence challenges that work for you a lot of the time. So I'm also coming into this assuming that there's sort of a baseline um, amount of skill and success um, with all of you that are that are um, attending this webinar right now. Um, but that, you know, there are times when your usual ways of influencing others, they fall down, they don't work for you. Um, you walk away scratching your head wondering, why didn't that thing work? Like they seem to be more upset rather than less and I didn't get what I needed out of that situation. Um, and so uh, today I hope what I can offer up are a few areas where there's some low hanging fruit, where there are some ways in which we actually get in our own way when we're trying to influence other people. Um, and so here I will just add one more thing, which is um, I wanna acknowledge that some of the influence challenges that you are dealing with are likely very complex and sort of go beyond or will not be easily solved by the techniques I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so anytime you're in a situation with many, many stakeholders, that's a big structural challenge um, around influence that these techniques can help, but they won't fully solve. So um, certainly for those of you that have very complex challenges, you can reach out to me um, after the webinar if, if you're looking for more. Um, so the third thing I will say is this, the, the techniques that I'm gonna talk through with you today, uh, in my view, they're really, um, they may not be designed to do this, but I think um, a useful byproduct of using the, this set of uh, techniques and approaches is that we can genuinely strengthen those relationships that matter to us, both at work and at home. Um, I, I think some people perhaps may be wondering or thinking, all right, so is this going to be a webinar with a bunch of ideas on how to manipulate people? Because, <laughs> um, you know, I don't know what I think about that. Um, and here I would say, look, you, you can be the judge of that at the end of the session. Did this sound like a bunch of techniques to really bamboozle people? You be the judge. Um, I tend to draw a pretty strong distinction between manipulation and sort of these kinds of influence techniques. In my mind, manipulation, it looks like this. You walk away from an exchange um, and at, at some point sooner or later, um, uh, if you feel like you've been manipulated, you start having um, some remorse and some upset and some negative reaction to what happened. Like, ugh, I can't believe, you know, they got me to agree to that thing. I'm really annoyed by that. 
Um, and now I'm going to work to get out of anything I may have agreed to that now I don't think was a good idea for me. I'm going to have some suspicion and distrust of you. Um, and I'm, I'm certainly going to be more wary the next time I'm engaging with you. Um, those should not be byproducts of the techniques I'm going to talk about. Um, but again, you be the judge. So, uh, you know, who is this webinar really designed for? Who can it be helpful for? In a nutshell, everybody, because like I said, we're all influencing all the time. We all run into challenges at, at, at one point or another. Um, and so I don't care if you are the most technical individual contributor, you sit in your cubicle or you sit in your lab and you rarely interact with people except to send out your data. Um, I, I don't care if that's your role, you are still influencing people to take your data seriously, um, to, uh, to do something with your data. Um, or you could be a leader managing teams, hundreds or thousands of people. Um, I don't care if you're the quietest introvert, you know, the world has known, <laughs> or the most gregarious extrovert. Um, we can all get better at um, our influencing skills. My husband is the natural athlete in our family. He has awesome hand-eye coordination. I have terrible hand-eye coordination, but you know what? I can get better, even though I'm not a natural at it. Um, so that's the spirit in which I invite you to um, engage with us today. So lastly, um, so I did invite you to, to be thinking about a real influence challenge that um, is fairly recent for you, didn't go well. And I invited you to write down, you know, some of the exchanges of what happened in that conversation. If you did that, awesome. If you haven't had a chance to do that, I do invite you to think about a specific influence challenge and at least have it in your head as we go along. Um, and if you can't think of anything um, that has happened in, in the recent past, in the, in the last, I don't know, two months, three months, um, you can think generally about the kinds of influence challenges um, that are on your plate. Um, and here, I, just to give me a sense of the range of influence challenges that you may be thinking about, would you just type into the chat box, you know, what, what's the basic nature of the influence challenge that's on your mind that you wrote up or maybe didn't write up, um, but is in your head? What kind of influence challenges are you hoping to get some ideas about in this session? Go ahead and write that into the chat window and I'll just see what kinds of examples come in. Just gives me a handle on what you're facing. Okay, so getting a strategy approved. Um, I'm not being recognized. Um, I'm trying to get executive buy-in to tackle a technical problem. Um, what kind of work projects I get to, um, to do at work. Um, getting people to buy into our technology, uh, getting, dealing with somebody who, who is manipulative, working with a superior, interviewing, building trust with my team, um, personal relationship, being heard. Um, okay, great. So there's a lot on your plate. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm hoping that what I'm going to be talking about today, you'll find relevant um, in one way or another. Um, great that I saw at least a couple of examples that were in your personal life. So all the same dynamics that are, are um, getting in our way of influencing more effectively at work, those same dynamics are showing up at home and in our communities and with our neighbors and with our kids' teachers. So really, you can be thinking about um, a, a very wide range of challenges as we go along. Okay, great. So I'm glad to see so many of you have something specific in your head. Um, so so let's, let's jump forward. Um, all right, the key question is, so what can I do when people aren't listening, right? And, and there are actually different versions of not listening, by the way, right? One version of, you know, people aren't listening to me is really, they are not literally hearing me or taking my ideas into account or even responding, acknowledging that I'm saying things. That's one version of people aren't listening. Another version is, you know, they're hearing me, but I'm just not getting much engagement and my ideas are falling flat. They're kind of running out of gas. It's not going anywhere. That's another version of not listening. Um, yet another version of not listening is I'm, I'm getting active resistance or reactance to my ideas. Um, and so for me, listening means sort of agreeing with me or doing something with my ideas. And right now I'm running into um, brick walls or just arguments or people um, are objecting in one way or another. Um, so wherever you are in the people aren't listening to me um, frame of mind, there are a few things that we can, we can do to improve our ability to get through and gain traction with other people. Um, I'm going to be talking about three really just classic mistakes that I see people make. This is through my years of, of work with thousands of people in lots of different industries. Um, there are three really practical and tangible ways that we kind of get in our own way. And the good news is there are some relatively easy fixes 
for some of those, mis for at least the three mistakes that I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, and so the, the first one that I'm gonna talk about is, is this. You know, we all have sort of comfort levels and sort of habits around how we tend to engage in conversation and just how we verbalize our thoughts and views. The first mistake that I see people make over and over again is that we tend not to adjust our level of directness to the context, to the people involved, to the expectations that may be in play um, in, the, in the conversation or the meeting or the working relationship. Um, so I grew up in the Midwest um, and there's like a real Midwest nice <laughs> kind of sensibility there where you know people don't voice very openly criticism or negative things. It's sort of seen as impolite. And so there's a great deal of indirectness, <laughs> at, le at least in my family of origin, <laughs> that we communicated in ways that just did not name the problem out of the gate. Now, um, I have a brother-in-law, John, who grew up in Queens and his upbringing was almost the polar opposite, right? His, he has three brothers, and like their favorite thing to do at mealtime was have giant political debates. Like half of them are Republicans, half of them are Democrats, and they would go at each other and just like the most scathing criticisms and arguments would fly across the table. And then at the end of it, they would all be like, oh, that was awesome. You know, meanwhile, I would be wilting like a flower in the corner if I was part of that conversation. So we have sort of tendencies and habits around how direct or indirect we are. And we tend not to adjust those for the, for the context. So uh, I wanna share this cartoon. I love this cartoon. I think it's a New Yorker cartoon. You know, people around a table at a meeting with one of the men saying, that's an excellent suggestion, Ms. Triggs. Perhaps one of the men here would like to make it. Now, I love this cartoon. It never fails to get a laugh. You know, virtually everyone can relate to this. Um, women in particular can relate to it, um, but it's not necessarily a gendered phenomenon, right? A lot of us have had that experience of, you know, saying the thing in the meeting that we thought was like a good idea, we flagged an issue that should be talked about, whatever it is, and it, and it sort of fell flat. And then, you know, Jamie, 10 minutes later, kind of voices the same thing. And everybody's like, oh, great thought, Jamie. Super frustrating, right? And then Jamie gets credit. Um, so annoying, okay? We get that. Now, I want to be clear in saying there could be a lot of different kinds of dynamics in play in a, in a meeting or a conversation like this. Um, there could be some organizational, just some cultural norms that are not very healthy, that tend to um, uh, uh, emphasize some voices over others. It could also be the person running that particular meeting is not particularly skilled in facilitating a conversation where everybody's voice can be in the conversation. Um, I, but what I want to talk about is another possibility, which is that Ms. Triggs um, has not adjusted her level of directness to be appropriate for the group that she's working with. And here's what I mean by that. Um, there's something called the mitigated speech scale that, um, that talks about different ways or, or different levels of directness in how we communicate with each other. So Malcolm Glad Gladwell references this in, in one of his books. Um, I first read about it um, uh, in the context of um, airplane crashes where, um, the, it was determined that it was pilot error for um, you know, some of these airplane crashes. And upon further investigation, you know, there were these cockpit conversations between co-pilots co and pilots that um, were totally ineffective. Um, and more specifically is that the co-pilot in at least one of these examples was noticing a real, a problem, right? An instrument um, reading was off or, you know, they, they, had a visual on um, ice on the wing, even though they had just been de-iced. And that co-pilot was trying to signal to the pilot that there was a problem and they should um, you know, not take off until they address the problem. Um, and the problem in those, um, uh, in, in those accidents was that the co-pilot spoke up too indirectly. So let me just talk you through sort of what the, the scale includes. So at the bottom of the scale, um, the most indirect way that we can voice anything is, is through a hint. So let's imagine, let's go away from Ms. Triggs for a moment, but let's imagine that um, it's Monday morning, some colleague of yours promised to have a report in your inbox um, you know, by 8 a.m. and now it's noon and you don't have it. And then you see this colleague in the hall. So a hint would sound something like this. Um, you ask, oh, how was your weekend? <laughs> so the thing about a hint is that it's so indirect that it's, it's slightly off topic, 
right? Like they, there's an embedded message in here, but it's really easy for the target of your hint to totally miss it, right? Um, and by the way, hinting is sort of, uh, uh, it's like the, the definition of passive aggressiveness. <laughs> um, and it turns out to be fairly ineffective um, and irritating for both people involved, right? The hinter is, is mad or irritated that like the person didn't get the hint, like, you know, why don't you get it? I made a sarcastic, you know, comment about your weekend. You know, don't you understand that you blew off the thing you promised me? Meanwhile, the person who has been hinted to, you know, they don't get it. It does fly over their head. And if they later get wind of what you were really after, they're annoyed because they're thinking, well, how was I supposed to read your mind? Um, how hard would it have been to just ask me about it? If you had something to say, you should have just said so. So this is the most indirect way we can engage. Um, you know, there's, we can um, be more, we can do better. So we could instead make an observation. Um, and so, oh gosh, I don't see the report in my inbox. All right, that's, that's a little better than a hint, but it's still a little hard to read what you want um, or what you're after. Maybe you ask a question, you know, were you able to get to it? Um, were you able to finish it over the weekend? Okay, um, you, that's, you know, moving up the scale of directness. Um, so another version, you could offer a suggestion, you know, you could send it to me after lunch or you could make a recommendation. Recommendation might be, you really should get it to me ASAP. Um, and then the most direct version of, of communicating is issuing a directive or a command. And here, you know, go send me the document right now <laughs> would be a version of directing or commanding. So part of the problem is um, we have these comfort zones. We tend to land in particular places on this scale. We don't adjust it. So if we go back to the Ms. Triggs example, it's possible that what she verbalized was in the form of an observation or a question. And it did actually fly over the heads of other people in the room, except for Jamie, who did hear it and then just was thinking on it for a few minutes. And then when Jamie spoke up, Jamie spoke up higher on this scale. Jamie made a recommendation, perhaps. And so that recommendation was direct enough for people to hear it and take it on board and then respond to it. So the, the classic advice, or the classic, the advice I offer around this is one, be aware of sort of where your tendencies are. I tend to be lower down on, um, on this scale out of habit, but I've certainly learned how to adjust um, given, given the audience, the expectations, you know, who the decision makers are in the room, what my relationships are to those people. And I will make adjustments periodically. Um, so let me, uh, the, um, the example that I had put on screen early on, if you were going to write up your own personal example to track through the session, this is the sample. Let me just read, read it through because we're going to refer to this a few times. So this is something that happened. This was an actual exchange um, that a client of mine had. Um, the client was the manager and is the me in this circumstance. Um, and so the manager um, says, you know, please provide your quarterly assessment by tomorrow. Their employee is the them. You know, I'm busy with high priority tasks. I don't think I'll be able to get it to you by then. I asked you two weeks ago. I really need it tomorrow. Uh, there's no way I can get it done. Me, it's not an option. Please turn it in by tomorrow. Okay, I'll try, but I can't guarantee that I'll get it to you. <laughs> and then our manager, me, is saying, oh, great. I'm looking forward to receiving it tomorrow. Um, so by the way, what are the odds that um, our boss is going to get the assessment by tomorrow? I mean, like probably zero, right? Um, so if we look at this example for, you know, how direct or indirect was the boss being? The boss is trying to influence the employee to get, get me this thing that I need. Um, how direct or indirect were they? Um, you know, here I would say actually that the boss is really kind of heavy on directing or commanding, really at the top of the scale. Um, and I, so I wanted to use this example partly because I think it, it speaks to sort of a false assumption that we sometimes make, which there's sort of a twofold assumption. Um, one is, so a lot of us have these influence challenges and we think, oh God, if I was just the boss, I could finally get things done. Like people would finally listen to me and do what I ask. Well, you know what? This is like one very clear example where being the boss does not always solve the problem, okay? You, you still have to re rely on influence a lot of the time. Um, but secondly, you know, people can also make an assumption that when there is a status differential and I'm in the higher status role, I, I am the boss or, you know, I have more experience, I'm the more tenured person or, or whatever, you know, I can get away with more direct speech, you know, if, especially if I'm talking sort of down the chain, right? And, and so here we do see a manager sort of engaging in directive or commanding type of speech. And by the way, do not be thrown by the word please. 
that's showing up in the boss's um, uh, uh, text here. If you remove the word, if you just cover up the word, please, you can see pretty clearly the boss is saying like, get it to me, do it, <laughs> make it happen. And so here I would say, you know, one of the, the mistakes that this boss or manager is making right now is they're over relying on too direct a, a mode of communication to get through. Um, and so here uh, I would be coaching the, the manager to consider experimenting with some moves that are lower down on that scale. For example, making an observation or asking a question. Or even better, like combining the two. So maybe it sounds like, all right, it looks like you're juggling a lot right now. Talk to me about how you're making decisions about what to prioritize. So notice already how different <laughs> Um, the exchange is likely to be um, if this manager moves away from command or direct and into um, observation, asking a question, sort of lower down on the scale. Um, so here, um, I think we have a poll question, Erin. Yep, let me just get that up. Okay, everyone should see that question on your screen. So this is, a, again, referring back to the influence example that Stacy had asked everyone to be considering. Yeah, and again, if you don't have a specific example in mind, you can think more generally. Where, where do you think you tend to fall? Um, that's fine. Okay, I'm just gonna wait a moment. People are still voting. Great, we have about 900 alumni viewers at the moment. Terrific. All right, I'm gonna end the poll here and share the results. Stacy, can you see that on your screen? I can, yes. Okay, so quite, oh, quite a range. Yeah, great. So um, <laughs> I'm glad to see hinting is, is relatively low percentage. Um, although maybe I put people off of admitting it when I was like, that's super passive aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and relatively low percentage in the directive or command. So, um, you know, generally speaking, I would say there, there is a sweet spot in those other um, categories um, between these two extremes. And many of you are there. But what I would say is you might want to experiment, which is make some adjustments up or down, right? So if you tend to be making an observation fairly frequently, see what it sounds like to, to turn that into a suggestion instead. Or if you're in the business of making recommendations, what would it be like to back off of that and um, make it uh, ask a question about it or make an observation? Um, would that make a difference in the kind of response or engagement you're getting from others in the room? All right, so we can, uh, we'll close this and we'll move forward. So, um, so the first uh, mistake, we don't adjust our level of directness. So sort of my prescription here is, you know, do some experimentation um, up or down on um, trying out different levels of directness with the mitigated speech scale. So let's move on to the second mistake. Um, this one I see chronically, chronically, chronically all the time with all clients in every sector. Um, we talk about our needs. Now, when we're influencing other people, we, there's, we make a really um, uh, uh, common assumption. It's not a bad assumption. And it goes something like this. If I want them to agree with me or to do something different, they have to know what I want, what I need, what I care about, right? They have to know my perspective. So that's gonna lead me to talk about my own needs, my views, my perspective, et cetera. Um, what is wrong with that? Here, what I would say is the thing that is wrong with that is this. Um, we oftentimes, um, when we get so focused on our own needs and sort of uh, uh, broadcasting them to the other person, hey, you gotta know what, I, what I'm trying to solve for so you can help me solve it. Um, what we tend to downplay, ignore, or sometimes just drive right over is the other person's needs. So, you know, in some of your influence challenges, maybe what you're thinking is, well, I need additional resources. Um, I need buy-in, right, on that strategic plan I have. I need data from your team. I need your edits on this thing by tomorrow. I need your approval to move this forward. I need better performance out of you or your team. I need your cooperation. I need your agreement on, you know, particular terms. I need you to listen to me. None of, there's nothing wrong with these per se. The problem is, what is the other person thinking about? Whose needs are they focused on? I, I mean, they're gonna be focused on their own needs. So while you are busy crafting sort of your best 
um, argument that you're, you're, um, you're putting forth for the best reasons why they should um, uh, take your needs into account, they're busy thinking things like, Ugh, I'm already over budget for the quarter. Um, I, I don't have budget to offer you up. I, there are other priorities. I don't have time for this. This thing you want actually just makes my life worse because it's more work on my plate or I don't really see the problem here. You keep pushing me to, to solve something that I don't even see as a, as, as a difficulty. Um, I don't wanna set a bad precedent. If I say yes to you, that's gonna set me up for a whole bunch of other people asking for this thing and I can't say yes to all of them. Um, the higher ups will never agree to the terms that you're asking for. I won't be able to get sign off. Um, or, or I need you to listen to me. So while you are busy trying to get them to um, pay attention to your needs, their heads are really full of their needs. And so that's problematic for you for at least two reasons. One is um, they can't hear you. <laughs> their internal voice is really loud with all of this kind of stuff, right? Because people are fundamentally self-interested <laughs> and they are gonna care probably more about their needs than they do about yours. And so if the thing that you're asking them for or wanting from them actually creates difficulty or conflict, their head is gonna be really busy kind of making those counter arguments so that your good ideas actually aren't gonna get through. Um, as human beings, we can't multitask. We can't, like, there's lots of um, you know, data emerging and lots of experiments I've run with clients that show that we can't hold these two simultaneous sets of ideas um, in our head at once. So one, you're not gonna get through. But two, the thing you may be asking for really doesn't meet any of those needs. Or like I said, it creates more problems for them. And so they really don't see that there's anything in it for them. Does that make sense? So you are um, essentially trying to push um, sort of your agenda, if you will, whatever your agenda is, um, often without taking into account, you know, what's on their plate um, and what would be the win or the positive or the, the net um, upside for them if they agreed with you. So the basic advice that I have on this front is, hey, you want to take some time, um, ideally in advance of these exchanges, these influence conversations you're trying to have to step into their shoes. And you're really trying to figure out a few key things. One, what are they really worried about? What are their needs? What's in their head? Um, you know, whether it's different priorities, um, the precedent concerns, et cetera. Um, and what, what might make them want to say yes to me? Right, we're starting to, to go now in a direction of reverse engineering, okay? So if currently you're getting some kind of resistance, they're not listening to you because you know, you're not addressing their needs, um, what might you need to address that would shift their thinking and make them say, huh, so this is intriguing. This actually solves a few problems for me rather than creates new problems. Huh, maybe I wanna say yes to this. And once you've done that, then you want to think about, all right, so how could I be adjusting the proposal, the thing I'm asking for, the suggestion I'm making, the concern I'm raising to take all of that into account? Um, so I think at this point, we have a second poll, Aaron. And so here, um, I want to invite you to think about your own, um, your own influence challenge and yeah, here we go. So question two, how well do you understand the other person's needs, concerns, worries, et cetera? So this is just a gut check answer. It's not scientific, but it's, you know, where, where do you think you are in terms of how well you currently understand that other person's needs, hopes, concerns, fears? Okay, just give everyone a moment to vote. Okay. Okay, I'm going to close out the poll. All right. Okay, great. So um, the 23% of you that you know them extremely well, good. <laughs> um, I want to focus right now on the remainder. So that's the 77% of you that are something short of really deeply understanding your counterpoints, um, interests, and needs. So uh, how do you find out what they really care about? Well, you know, maybe that there's some educated guesses you can make, you know them well enough that you, if you put pen to paper and really try to climb into their shoes, you know, okay, I could probably figure it out. A lot of us don't take the time to actually do that. So that would be an initial step I would recommend. 
Um, but secondly, the very best source on you know what this person really cares about, what they're worried about, or what the obstacles are for you is them. And so what this um, what this step really argues for is um, having a conversation with them that is really focused on discovery. It's really focused on understanding. So what what for you is um, the core problem with my proposal? What's holding you back? Um, what's giving you heartburn? Um, what else is on your plate that may be pushing my thing you know, to the bottom of the list? Um, so that conversation where you're really focused on learning and unearthing from them, sort of what's going on, um, you know, what you're looking for is information that you could then take back and, and sort of reshape your proposal. Um, uh, here, so the phenomenon, so, okay, a couple of things on this. Um, you've got to go into that discovery conversation with a spirit of curiosity. You genuinely want to know sort of what makes them tick, you know, what's making them say no to you. You cannot go in asking a whole bunch of gotcha questions designed to trap them. <laughs> that is the opposite of finding out, you know, what your core obstacles are. Um, and it's going to shut them down and create defensiveness and they'll be super annoyed with you. So you don't want to go in with that. Like this is not an interrogation. You know, you're not scripting your questions that are yes, no, and designed to get them to admit weaknesses and fault. Um, you really want to go in just, hey, I want to understand what's, you know, what's happening for you. I thought this was, you know, a really straightforward um, idea. I thought it was going to be an easy yes, and it's clearly not. And I just want to understand more about that. So for those 77% of you that are somewhere short of fully understanding your counterpart's um, perspective, um, I really do recommend some kind of discovery exchange. Um, so the second thing I'll say about um, doing that discovery piece of work is that when we are trying to influence somebody, um, we care about the topic um, and we're under some kind of pressure, time pressure, um, or it's a, it's a high profile thing. And so lots of people are watching. And so we're, we're under pressure to get results. All of our discovery and question asking skills go out the window. If you looked back at your transcript, for those of you that wrote a transcript of I said this and they said that and I, et cetera, I predict that there would be either zero questions from you, maybe one question, but most of the statements that you wrote down would be exactly that statement, advocacy, pressing your case. Um, because again and again, and I've run this experiment with thousands of people, I will, I will simulate conditions of um, you care about this thing, you're trying to change somebody's mind and um, there's pressure around it. Um, and again and again, the behavior that shows up in those situations is we stop asking questions, we stop being curious about um, what's in their head and, and why they're saying no, and we go to statement making and pressing our case. Um, so I, I'd have, uh, there are probably a couple of outliers in this group, um, we're a large enough group, um, that maybe some of you are asking lots of questions, but even if you are asking lots of questions in your personal transcript, um, I, I would press you to really um, look at the quality of those questions. Are they really curiosity-based, open-ended, really designed to help you learn something you don't already know? Or are they, design, are they like rhetorical questions? Or um, you, know, you don't really think that, do you? <laughs> Which th I, I would argue that's not really a question, right? That's sort of an embedded view. Um, that comes out of your mouth um, with like sort of a question mark at the end. So what we're aiming for is you want to have a discovery conversation that um, you put aside your own influence purposes, at least for that exchange. Um, you need better information in order to craft a better proposal that will um, get you um, that yes that you're after. Um, so let's come back to the, the example that we looked at um, um, earlier. So this is the boss trying to get the quarterly self-assessment. So if we thought for a moment about, well, well, what are the employees' concerns or needs? You know, here, you can probably guess at least a couple of them from this exchange that's already happened, right? So the employee is probably concerned about, you know, failing to meet deadlines on high priority um, projects that are on their plate. Um, and potentially they're also um, concerned about spending time on, you know, this task that seems like busy work, it doesn't seem to hold much value, you know, it, it, it's a waste of time. So if we took those as sort of the core concerns of, of the employee, then the question becomes, all right, how can our boss adjust the requests that they're making um, in order to get um, a, a, a better outcome, right? If at the end of the day, what the boss wants is I need that assessment completed, 
I'm trying to influence this person to do that, then I'm, if I'm the boss, I might want to adjust my um, proposal in, you know, one of the following ways, you know, maybe you are, you control the other projects on this person's plate. Maybe you can change the timeline um, or the deadlines on the high priority stuff. Um, maybe you could temporarily reassign the high priority project. Maybe somebody else can, you know, handle the work, you know, for the amount of time it takes this person to go do the assessment. Maybe you can spring for lunch, right? And so that it's a working lunch where, um, you know, this employee or, or everybody um, who hasn't done the assessment can just do it over their lunch hour, you know, depending how much time it takes. Maybe you triage the assessment. Maybe there are some portions of it that are really the high priority, especially needed by tomorrow, but there are other portions that could wait longer. Um, so maybe you triage it, prioritize it. Um, and this last one, this, um, this can really get into the performance management space. If the self-assessment is part of a performance evaluation process, um, you know, if you're the, um, the boss um, or part of the leadership, you might want to consider ways to make that assessment um, actually be more valuable to your employees, right? If it's a paper assessment that just gets filed with their um, personnel file and nobody ever does anything with it, it's sort of no wonder that they see it as low value and they don't want to do it. Right, so this, this would be sort of a, a bigger effort and longer term and involve other things, um, but that is another way that you could change the kind of results that you're getting at least over the longer term. All right, so um, if this is our, uh, so the way it sounds, um, by the way, when you're having these conversations, um, you know, you'd wanna approach a follow-up conversation with the following. All right, so, you know, based on what I've learned from you, I know that you're concerned about X and Y and Z, and, you know, I've come up with a way that I think we could address that. And then here's the third part that I really strongly recommend that you include <laughs> when you're putting forward your new proposal um, to your target. Um, add this bit. So what am I missing? What would be wrong with this? And I really, I strongly suggest this last bit because there's this very counterintuitive um, kind of truth <laughs> about um, being influential. And it is this. You become more influential when you demonstrate that you yourself are willing to be influenced. So adding this third bit, you know, what am I missing? You know, what did I not take into account? Um, you know, what do we still need to talk through here? That demonstrates, it signals to the other person that you're willing to have a dialogue about it. You are not being so rigid about, so this is my new solution. You have to agree to my new solution no matter what. It is signaling, okay, maybe, um, maybe this is off, maybe this needs to change you know, yet again, and I'm open to that. Um, you, there's a, just that funny thing in human behavior that we really respond. <laughs> we, I will be influenced by you when I see that you are willing to be influenced by me. All right, so if that second um, classic mistake that I see all the time is that we tend to overfocus on talking about our own needs, um, then the antidote to that is, really this sort of reverse engineering process. You wanna find out and then speak to the things that the other person is really concerned about that right now are creating obstacle or um, resistance in them that they don't wanna say yes to you because their own needs, there's not really a win in it for them. All right, so let's talk about the third mistake that I see um, rather frequently. And, and all right, so this one is all about, we, we inadvertently sometimes create emotional reactants in our influence targets. We don't totally realize we're doing it. We're probably not doing it on purpose, but nonetheless, we step on um, people's core concerns, which I'll describe in a moment. And that in turn causes people um, to, say, to say no to us, to disregard us, to ignore us, to not listen to us, okay? So what do I mean by core concerns? So we, in our working relationships, um, and frankly, in personal relationships too, but let's talk about work relationships. We all have a set of core concerns. Sometimes um, we call them e emotional interests. So this comes out of some research um, done uh, at the Harvard Negotiation Project. They were uh, uh, Roger Fisher, Dan Shapiro. Um, they teamed up to look at the role of emotions in negotiation. And um, what they postulated was that people have these core sets of, of needs in working relationships um, that they wanna have well met. Um, and so th those needs include the following. Um, so the first one is autonomy. What do I get to control or decide um, in, this, uh, uh, in this exchange, in this conversation? Um, what, what am I in charge of? If you've ever had a micromanager, they're stepping on autonomy all the time and that creates you know, a big reaction, right? Um, so uh, second core interest, affiliation. 
we want to be part of things. We want to be um, in the loop and consulted. We're in the know. Um, and sometimes uh, that can get stepped on in these exchanges. Um, appreciation. We all want to know that people just see how hard we're working here. <laughs> um, appreciation can really drop out fast um, in core working relationships, especially for really smart, very problem solving oriented people. We tend to focus on like the squeaky wheel, like, like let's just solve for the thing um, that isn't working right now. And we take for granted all the stuff that is working. Um, so appreciation can drop out really quickly. Um, role, here what I mean is um, we have a way of telling the story of our lives it, it, um, as stories where there are characters. And um, any good story, as you know, um, has heroes and villains. Um, and we like to be cast, um, human beings like to be cast more so in the hero role than the villain role. Inadvertently, you may be casting the other person um, sort of as the villain or bad guy um, in your influence um, challenge that can be very off-putting for them. Um, and then status has to do with the amount of deference or respect that we offer or receive um, from each other. Am I getting the right amount of respect from you um, just given our, um, given um, my expertise or my organizational role, um, uh, my experience, et cetera? When these are all well met, you get um, very high performing teams. But in our influence challenges, we tend to accidentally be stepping on these in one way or another. So let's go back to our example one more time. So uh, I, I think the boss here is actually inadvertently stepping on um, arguably all of these core concerns I've just described. So um, on autonomy, there's a bunch of unspoken messages that the employee may be getting here, right? On autonomy, um, you know, there's sort of this message that like, you don't get to decide employee whether or when you're gonna do this assessment. Um, you know, it's not up to you. On affiliation, the employee may be feeling stepped on potentially in the sense that like, and I don't really care what your views are on whether this assessment is valuable or not. <laughs> um, you know, you don't get to be part of that conversation on what we're trying to do with this assessment or how we're trying to do it. Um, on appreciation, there's sort of an unspoken, like, I don't really care how hard you're working on the other stuff um, or that you're trying to prioritize business needs. Like the only thing I care about is this particular assessment. Um, I don't appreciate what else is on your plate. Um, on role, this one can be subtle, but we, you know the, the boss could be sending a message, you're really dragging your feet and sort of you're the problem here, right? You're not getting the thing done. Um, and certainly there's a potential status dynamic here um, where the employee is really feeling, feeling the boss sort of sending a message of, look, I am the boss and you need to fall in line here. So, um, so last um, poll, Aaron, if, if you could. Sure. So here, this is an opportunity just to look again at, at your own, own case or sort of a, a, an influence challenge that's on your mind. Um, which of the other person's core concerns might you be accidentally stepping on? And you can pick as many as feel relevant. So you can pick more than one. Okay, I'm going to end this poll. Okay, so um, so lots of people um, across all of the categories. So whether you checked one or you checked many of them, let me just quickly offer up, I'm mindful of time when we want to get to questions. So what's the antidote? The antidote really is to make some positive moves across um, each of these fronts. So if you were to make a positive move on autonomy, you know, it really goes to this question of, um, you know, just name what is what is still in their control or what they do get to decide. Um, you know, hey, employee, I, I, I get you got a lot on our plate, on your plate, and ultimately you do need to decide how you're going to prioritize. You know, I want to I want to help clear the way so that it's easier for you to make the decision to do the assessment, but it's your decision. That would be one version of a positive move on autonomy, um, on affiliation you know, include this person in consultations, um, give them more information sooner, you know, get out of the, you know, you're on a need to know basis um, uh, 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 mentality, if any of you are there. Um, people tend to like to be involved sooner, even if they don't get to be a decision maker. Um, the fact that they get more information about what's happening um, tends to be comforting and meets people's need for affiliation. Um, really think about recognizing people's efforts. These can be very low cost, high value moves. You know, the person did get the report to you by 8 a.m. Monday. You send them a quick email at 8.05. Um, hey, I see that you got this to me. I'm so appreciative. I imagine you had to give up parts of your weekend to get it done. 
you know, I'll review it later on today and get back to you on the substance, but thank you for going the extra mile. It doesn't have to cost a lot. Um, on role, really work to give the other person a positive role, right? Can you enlist them as a co-problem solver with you? You know, hey, we've got this challenge together um, of, of solving for this assessment that I know it's a process that, you know, you find onerous um, and seems to be interfering. Um, I imagine, you know, you may have some ideas on how we can get this done. Um, and I'd love to hear them because uh, certainly it's creating a bit of a challenge for me because I've got people expecting me to, to send these on. So I'd love to hear your ideas. Um, and on status, really showing an appropriate amount of status. You can, you can recognize other people's experience. Um, you, can, you can recognize that, you know, for example, you know, hey, you're closer to the problems. Um, you know, you see a lot more than I do and, and I need to learn from you um, that it's really important that you have things um, that, that I just don't. You don't have to bash your own status to lift somebody else's status up. Um, but the core idea here is you wanna look for ways to just uh, make a positive move and recognize um, you know, offer some respect, some deference for whatever experience they're bringing to the situation. All right, so the three big mistakes, we don't adjust our level of directness, we focus on our own needs, we don't take theirs into account, we inadvertently step on other people's core concerns, these all contribute to people not listening to us, um, or certainly being um, um, persuaded or influenced by us. So the antidotes, experiment with the speech mitigation scale, reverse engineer, talk to their needs, build that into your proposal and your request, and then work to positively meet their needs for autonomy, appreciation, affiliation, role, and status. So I know I used up a lot of the time, but I do, if we have any time for questions, I'm happy to take a couple. Absolutely. Um, and just a reminder to folks, the webcast today will be posted to our YouTube channel um, on, so it's the, you look for the alum, MIT Alumni Association, and under that there'll be a career lunch and learn playlist. Um, and that usually just takes about a week from the live broadcast to post. Um, all right, let's get to some questions. Um, so here's a scenario. Uh, I'm pitching an idea or a recommendation in a meeting to my coworkers, and I've done a lot of prep work, including pulling um, several data points that really support my recommendations. Um, I guess, to summarize the question, shouldn't my data speak for itself? Like, shouldn't that be strong enough of an influencer to really get my colleagues thinking in a different direction? What would yeah. you say to clients that you've worked with that, that kind of bring up that point? Yeah, yeah. So it's a great question and I'll answer it in two parts. One is, I mean, particularly for a bunch of MIT alums, I think the question of like, shouldn't my data be enough? I mean, we are trained <laughs> to be really, really good at producing really high quality data and doing research the right way. And you know, shouldn't that um, uh, swing things? Um, I, I'm a big fan of data and doing it well and doing it right. Um, and um, the problem is this, um, data doesn't always say the same thing to every person. <laughs> right? So your data may be great, valid, well done. Um, and, and different people will still draw different conclusions about the relevance of the data, the implications of the data, the decisions that um, should derive from the data, um, where and how we should use the data. Um, so, and those are not questions strictly about the data itself, but about how to use the data. And that's where you still have to be in the business of influencing other people with your words, <laughs> because the numbers do not um, inevitably give other people the same message that they are so clearly you know, uh, speaking to you, for example. Like for you, the implications are obvious, um, but frankly, other people have different brains and different experience um, and different roles um, and different rewards. They're rewarded for different things. And so they're gonna see and interpret that data quite differently than you. So you still have to engage with people to understand how are you seeing the data what conclusions are you drawing from the data? And there has to be sort of an influence conversation at that level. Um, to the um, to the sort of the dan dynamic of I'm in the meeting. I'm trying to pitch, you know, a proposal. Um, Here, when I work with clients who are in similar circumstances, um, I do a lot with them in advance of that pitch meeting. Um, particularly, what I do is we do some mapping about who the key decision makers are, who the influencers are of the decision maker. Let's anticipate the objections that and questions that the decision maker and their influencers are gonna have in the conversation. Maybe I'll go have sidebar conversations in advance um, and have just, just private chats like, hey, I'm thinking you know, this would be a great idea. 
to get the whole team on board with, you know, what are your thoughts? You know, what, what would work or not work about this for you? And actually having a series of small exchanges um, in the lead up so that you can shape your proposal, um, not just, you know, by having great data, um, but also taking into account sort of the range of views that people in that room are gonna have. So that by the time you're in that pitch conversation, you have hopefully already um, sort of pre-addressed some of the questions and concerns that that group is likely to raise. Then the other important thing you wanna do um, is even after that, you still wanna demonstrate that openness, that, that curiosity, that, okay, and what am I missing? You know, I did what I could to take into account everything that I thought people would be worried about here. Um, am I missing anything? Is there anything new um, that has come up since I put this together um, that would affect, you know, whether you would support this or not? Okay. Um, and actually, my next question, you addressed this a little bit, but um, we've had a few folks um, say you had excellent examples when it's an influence, like one person influencing another person, yeah. but if you're trying to influence many people at the same time. Um, and again, you just gave, I think, some good um, recommendations here, but I don't know if you can elaborate just a little more on how to influence many people versus one person, because obviously everyone has very different opinions and viewpoints. And if you could just give some examples or strategies about how to address a room full of people versus um, just one person. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, the same general principles would apply. You want to be thinking a lot about who is in your audience. Um, and um, are they all, so, you know, without a specific example, I'm going to be talking a little bit generally, so I may not hit exactly what this person was asking about, but, um, you know, it, it, let's imagine you're trying to influence a number of people um, to all agree to go forward with such and such. And, you know, maybe they're in one room and you have one shot with them at the same time, but more than likely in most business settings, um, you know, it's, it's going to be a sequence set of conversations that you're having, um, perhaps one-on-one -on -one or perhaps in small groups. So um, again, I've, I've spent a lot of time with clients really um, just mapping out sort of who are the series of people that you're trying to influence. This is all about multi-part, this is multi-party negotiation. Um, and um, you're trying to get sort of a yes decision from multiple people. So here, what I really work, uh, work uh, hard on with clients is let's understand as well as we can, you know, who are the individuals that you really need to, to influence? You need to get a yes from them. Let's map them both, you know, sort of in the context of your organization, but also um, your relationship to them. Let's map the people around them that may influence them. And what is your relationship to those people? And then let's actually map out a sequence and a strategy of interactions. Um, because it may be that you want to leverage person A over here and get them, you know, they're already, you know, halfway convinced and, and halfway on board with you. If you can get them all the way on board and it turns out that person A is really influential with person B, now you can leverage person A and have them help you um, persuade person B. And, and not through strong arming them, <laughs> but through, you know, Hey, A is somebody who has similar concerns to you, person B, um, and you know they felt comfortable with this. Maybe you want to chat with them, or maybe we could all talk together. Um, and so the strategy really comes down to understanding exactly who you are trying to influence, what you are trying, what you need from them. Do you need their active engagement to move this thing forward, or do you simply need them not to object? So I worked as a city planner in my first couple of years out of school, and we did a two-year consensus building um, process for a project I was working on in my hometown. There were hundreds, if not thousands of, of community stakeholders that we wanted to get a yes from. Well, I tell you what, it was a whole series of interactions, both in large groups where we would be presenting, you know, here are some of the options we're considering, you know, let's get some feedback from you before we move this forward, to really small group, very focused conversations. It was property owners in this particular um, um, block where there was gonna be road construction, um, and it was hundreds of meetings over a two year period. And so we really chunked it um, and, and gave people lots of ways to interact with what we were trying to do and lots of ways to voice their views. And we recognized their views as best we could. And when we could not incorporate their views, we explained why. Part of the thing, it, like sometimes people don't care so much that the final decision is what they wanted as they just wanna understand why you went in a different direction. 
Um, and they're thinking, you know, well, you asked for my input, but you didn't use it. Why? And so when you do get to some kind of final, you know, thing that you're trying to sell or, or influence everybody to rally around, part of what you want to build in is, you know, and listen, we got some great input from a number of people um, and, and we couldn't take it all into account. And I want to just talk you through why we ended up um, discarding some of these choices in favor of others. Um, Cause I know, you know, people made an investment in giving us their views and, and some are likely disappointed not to see their views reflected here. So let me at least explain why and how we got to this point. Mm, that's great, thank you. Um, do you wanna do one more question and then we'll wrap up? Is that sound okay? Yeah, great. Um, this is a good one. So how do you get information out of someone who has a personality that's more introverted um, and doesn't really love to discuss their own needs or is it one that would share those openly in a work setting. Because um, a lot of what you talk about is really having that other person open up and understanding them. But in order to do that, the other person really needs to be a participant as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Um, so it's a great question. There's, all right, so I, this could go in a few different directions. Uh, like, one is there, they may not be comfortable sharing in a work setting. That could mean a couple of things. They don't want to share it with work colleagues. Or literally, I don't want to sit at work and be talking about things, um, you know, certain kinds of things. If that's the case, like go out for a meal, <laughs> like you know, do something outside of work where you know people might be more relaxed and more willing to talk. Um, but beyond that, um, I, quite frankly, I think you need to. Um, there's a couple of all right. There's a couple of things you can do. One is ex explain why you're asking and why you want to know. Right? If you start asking questions that people find intrusive or they find is going to some sensitive or some, you know, some areas that they, you know, they, they don't want to talk about or they're not used to talking about, it can be really helpful to offer up, you know, and here's why I'm asking. Like, I know you don't like to talk about this kind of stuff, um, but here's why I think it's important. You know, I'm about to put together this, you know, the, this idea, this whatever, or I'm thinking about staffing um, and um, it really helps me to better craft the thing that I'm trying to put together, if I have a good sense of what your priorities are, you know, what drives you, what makes, what makes you um, object to or get on board with, with the thing I'm putting together. So offering some explanation for why you're asking the questions and what you will do with the information can put some people at ease and be more willing to open up. Um, so that's one thing. Um, another technique that you can use, if, if even that sort of doesn't open them up, is this. You can just put like a proposal in front of them, like an idea, a suggestion or whatever, um, and then ask this, what would be wrong with doing this? Because there, it's very interesting. There are people in this world who, you know, they don't want to like open up, you know, directly and talk about themselves necessarily, but a lot of people are quite willing to criticize. <laughs> and so if you ask, all right, well, what would be wrong with doing it this way? Um, often people are willing to, to engage at that level. And, and what you're hearing as people are voicing their objections, you're starting to get clues about what's driving them, what's important to them. You know, they're not, they're not sharing it openly, um, but you're getting hints of it. And so you can listen through those objections and start hearing, oh, so there's, you know, there's some concerns around um, who, who gets credit um, on this paper that we're writing or, um, uh, you know, you're, you're hearing concerns about well, what does this mean for this other project that I'm on if, if I get involved with this thing. All right, so there's some concern for um, workflow or the kinds of project that, that this person is on. So you can kind of indirectly start to get at least hints or clues about what's driving people. Um, and then you can kind of, I think it's fair game to sort of gently ask some follow-up questions um, and, and see if they'll, they'll, they'll play that way. You, you could invite them to make, you know, what, what would, how could I tweak this? What would be another idea that would solve for that? Great. Um, we have so many great questions that have um, come in over the last hour. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. Um, Stacy, thank you so much for joining us today. That was um, an hour filled with such great content um, and examples. Um, and again, this um, presentation will be posted to um, the Career Lunch and Learn playlist within the MIT Alumni Association page on YouTube. Um, usually takes about a week to be posted. Um, and we will be sending out a survey today 
um, later this afternoon. So we really encourage you um, to provide feedback for us. It helps us plan for future webcasts and helps us continue to improve the programming that we're offering. Um, and also we had a lot of questions about slides. Um, if you would like a copy of the slides, just feel free to um, email us here at the Alumni Association um, at alumnicareers at mit.edu. Um, and again, on the survey too, there'll be some additional resources that Stacy had provided if you wanna do um, some reading beyond the presentation today on concepts that Stacy had presented. Um, okay. Again, Stacy, we can't thank you enough. Um, this, was, this was really fun. Awesome, thank you. And just as a parting salvo, um, I encourage you just to pick something intriguing you heard today and just think about places where you could just do some low risk experiments. Just try some stuff out on your influence challenge or more generally, um, that's, that's the way you're gonna get better at influencing. So hope it was useful. Um, thank you so much for the time. I had a great time with you. All right, thanks Stacy. Right. Take, Take care. care. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.